Wow, nice haul. Told ya, Macy's Backstage has perfect last minute gifts. With prices so low, you never need a coupon. I scored the perfect makeup palette. Super cute, I grabbed these cool drones for the guy. Nice, here's a handbag for Aunt Helen. Found awesome toys for the kids. Cookware for the budding chef. Oh, and look what I got for Uncle Hank. A puppy chew toy? No, no, that's for Rex. They even have gifts for pets. Well, you know Uncle Hank, he'd love anything <laughs> we gave him. Macy's Backstage, savings for everyday life. Details at Macy'sBackstage.com. Heed the call of summer with America's favorite summer seasonal beer. Leinenkugel's Summer Shandy, combining crisp vice beer with natural lemonade flavor. It's as refreshing as refreshment gets. Leinenkugel's Summer Shandy. Welcome to the liney side. Jacob's Line and Kugel Brewing Company, Chippewa Falls, Wisconsin. Please enjoy Liney's responsibly. Based on Nielsen, all outlets, data 52816, 82716. Blog Talk Radio. Welcome to Nonprofit U, a forum where nonprofit stakeholders can share lessons learned and discuss the latest developments in the industry. My name is Valerie Leonard, your host. I'm a consultant to nonprofits and I specialize in community and organizational development. I work with nonprofit organizations to help them make a stronger impact to their clients and communities. You can find Nonprofit U on Facebook and Twitter, and I encourage you to follow us and to comment early and often using the hashtags Nonprofit U or Effective Grant Writing Strategies. You can also leave comments on blogtalkradio.com forward slash nonprofit underscore U. The chat room is open and you can post comments and questions. In order to use the chat room, you have to have a listener-only account and you can find a link to open the account on the page for this episode that's on the bottom. And you can also email me questions at consulting at ValerieFLeonard.com. We'll be taking questions by phone and from our chat room at about the 20-minute mark. And the call-in number is 347-884-8121. Again, that number is 347-884-8121. Today's topic is developing effective grant writing strategies. We'll share grant writing strategies organizations can use as part of their sustainability toolbox, and we'll also examine the complete proposal writing cycle. We'll link proposal writing to the program design, implementation, and evaluation processes, and then we'll share strategies that you can begin to try at home immediately. Again, we encourage you to call in with questions at about the 20-minute mark. You can start posting in the chat room and emailing questions now. Again, my email address is consulting at valleyflinert.com. If you want to participate in the live chat, you must open an account, and the link is found on the episode page. The call-in number again is 347-884-8121. Nonprofit and community development professionals, as well as those who live in developing communities are especially encouraged to call in and share your stories and strategies. Today's guest is Noah Timoner Jenkins. Noah is a freelance organizational development and writing consultant for nonprofits, and her project portfolio includes grant writing, fundraising, planning, program evaluation, board development, and strategic planning. She's part of the adjunct for I'm sorry, she's part of the ACT faculty at UIC's College of Urban Planning and Public Affairs, and Noah teaches grant writing and related classes in the UIC Certificate in Nonprofit Management Program. She holds a Master of Urban Planning and Policy and a Bachelor of Arts in Spanish, both from the University of Illinois at Chicago, where she graduated Phi Beta Kappa. So thanks for joining us today, Noah. Um, Thank you for often- having me. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. We often see an RFP, and that's, you know, for those who may not know, a request for proposal. We respond to it, and we move on to the next thing, you know, usually the next proposal. However, there's actually a cycle. Can you share with us the major steps of the grant life cycle, and then let us know why it's important to understand the different phases? Sure. 
Um, I would say that the first thing that we really want to think about when we're considering raising money for a nonprofit organization comes before responding to an RFP or funder guidelines, and that really has to do with the organizational readiness for not Mm -hmm. just preparing a grant proposal, but for receiving that grant and executing it. So organizational Mm -hmm. readiness includes things like um, having financial policies and procedures in place so a potential funder knows that you can properly manage the money once you have it, Um, Mm -hmm. quality program design um, uh, for existing or ongoing programs, a history of outcomes for your programs. Mm -hmm. Of course, you have to have your 501c3 designation, um, which is a tax designation for a nonprofit organization uh, that enables the organization to receive charitable contributions. Um, So organizational readiness is um, a primary focus when you're just getting started with looking at securing funding. Um, Another Mm -hmm. phase that you might include as part of organizational readiness or think about a little bit separately is program design. So we're applying for money to fund a a particular program or a set of programs. And so are those programs well articulated? Can you write about them? Do you have specific inputs and specific outputs that you can write about that you can describe? Um, And then, And then you're at the sort of the proposal writing, the grant writing phase. And that's really where you're looking at the request for proposals or the funder guidelines, and you're really figuring out um, how to respond to that, how to present your program and your organization in the best possible light and in a way that really meets the funding criteria of the prospective funder. Um, And then uh, there's once you receive your grant award, There is, of course, executing the program as promised in the grant proposal and reporting on that, right? So your funder is going to want progress reports and final reports, and that's both narrative about how did the program go, how did you implement it, um, and then also financial, right? How did you spend their money? Um, And then... Another another aspect I would say as you're maybe moving on and looking at another potential funder, whether you received a grant proposal or you were declined, you want to think about lessons learned. What might have I mm-hmm. what might I have done better in my grant proposal um, to present a better case or a case that better fits this particular funder's expectations? Um, and then in, in executing the program, if I did receive funding. Um, what went really well and and what could have gone better and what changes Mm -hmm. might I make? And then um, we sort of start over. (laughs) Yeah, that's what I call a cycle, right? Right. (laughs) And and what I thought was very interesting is at the end of the day, people are not funding proposals, right? They're, They're funding people and and programs. That's what it sounded Mm -hmm. like to me as you were talking. Absolutely. Absolutely. And they're also funding um, solutions to problems that they care about. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. One step that I find that a number of emerging organizations might skip is the development of the case for support. And that's pretty important. And I even had one prospective client to tell me, you know, you know, she didn't want to waste her time working on things that weren't going to generate immediate impact. She wanted to, you know, cut to the chase and start submitting proposals. Can you tell our listening audience what a case of support is and why it's so important? Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a great question. Um, you know, one thing I would say before answering that question is, you know, as Valerie, as you know, these you know nonprofit organizations are so stretched for resources. It can be so hard to take the time out um, and the resources, whether it's person resources or money resources, to prepare these applications and things like the case for support. But you can't get the money if you don't do it. You just, <laughs> you, just you just can't get it. So 
we have to find the time and the resources to do these um, these really big tasks. <clears throat> so the um, the case for support is really um, as sort of as we understand it, working within an organization. What's the what's the problem or the issue that we're trying mm-hmm. to address, right? And you know, if you're if you're submitting a proposal for funding to to a potential funder, you you know this funder at least has a general interest in solving this particular problem. Um, so mm-hmm. you know, you you may not feel you may feel like you don't have to really make a case that this particular problem exists or mm-hmm. exists to the extent that it that it does or that you know that it does. Um, But funders, not all the people reading your proposals are going to really understand the complexity of a particular problem. And they really do look to us to educate them on on that. So they may understand it or care about it in a general way. And we really need to dig in and explain it in a very, um, in a very detailed kind of way. The other thing that's really important in a case for support is making the case that the solution that I'm proposing for this particular problem is the right solution or one of the right mm-hmm. solutions, and that my organization is one that can um, can provide this particular solution. So, you know, so for example, um, the problem might be, you know, something like as general as unemployment in some specific communities. Maybe I'm offering low cost or, or free child care. So my mm-hmm. case for support is going to convince this funder that a big part of the problem is that single mothers don't have an affordable place to put their children when they go to work. Right. So, you know, so that's sort of an example of how you might go about presenting a case. Mm-hmm. And, and two, what I find is the case for support also helps organizations reflect on what we would call that whole raison d'etre, the reason for being, and it helps to align all the activities um, within the organization. So, you know, not only are you using it to get funding, but it, it's also a good way, I think, to do reality checks and make sure that the activities that you're engaged in actually make sense you know, strategically. Um, oh, yeah, so I think that's a, absolutely right, yeah. yeah. It's a great management tool. So speaking of management tools, you know, we often uh, do things within organizations in our own little silos, and, you know, grant writing, that's no exception. There is usually, um, especially in emerging groups, I think larging, larger institutions have it down to a science, but there's very little coordination in between writing the proposals and the day to day operations and the programming, you know, pretty much like what you'll find in corporate where the sales staff is promising the client or prospective client one thing and then, you know, they get the sale in the door and then the folks who actually have to produce you know, the product, you know, they're like, What in the world did these people say? You know, so you have similar I guess kinds of conversations in a nonprofit. So we don't mm-hmm. always take the time to tie the grant proposal to the program design or the implementation or the evaluation. Can you share with the audience, you know, what some of the steps we can do to tie all those processes together and, and why it's important to do that? Sure. So the sort of the scenario that you describe is pretty pretty common, I think. And again, I think it ties back to um, us always being so pressed for resources that it can be it can be really difficult to take the time out to do really comprehensive planning around programming and proposal writing. Um, but if you if you're not really closely coordinating your applications for funding and your program design, your program implementation, and your evaluation, then you end up with this huge disconnect. You have funding for programs that are different than the programs that you're actually um, executing, and mm-hmm. um, and that can create that can create really big problems within an organization, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but 
in some ways I think it's really easy to address and and in other ways of course it's it it can be challenging because of the, the sort of the time pressures um but you know really there's different roles within an organization when it comes to grant writing and and they need to be coordinated just a, a little bit you know, the sort of the executive mm-hmm. leadership is providing a vision and mission and that includes the board and um and then you have programs who are really designing and executing the programming to meet the to meet the mission um and then you have evaluation where somebody within your organization hopefully you have a budget to um mm-hmm. do this uh, easily um <laughs> Tracking, right, tracking what you're doing and documenting the outcomes. What are the results of your programs? Um, and I, f- I find in a, um, a great role for the grant writer is actually to help coordinate that conversation. So mm-hmm. when I work with an organization, yeah, I mean, the, the writing grant proposals I've found over the years often can provide a really great planning tool for an organization um, sometimes mm-hmm. writing a grant, yeah. Sometimes writing a grant proposal is really the first time that an organization sort of uh, stops to think about uh, how to articulate what they're doing. So they may be running mm-hmm. a great program, they may be tracking outcomes, um, they may be doing all the different p- parts, but they may not be really well coordinated. They may not be well articulated. Um, it, you know, the the board may not know what a great job the organization is doing at executing on its mission, or there may be gaps. Um, mm-hmm. And then, but when you s- sit down, so, so, so as a grant writer or a development director, you sort of, you sit down and find a way to coordinate vision program and evaluation. And of course, uh, financial information is involved in that as well. Um, if you do, if you, if you do a good job of, listening to all mm-hmm. of those pieces and writing them up in a way that's sort of that's clear and concise and having everybody on the team review that and then maybe there's one more set of revisions and everybody is on this on the same page with mm-hmm. program um, with planning design implementation and evaluation um, and then you end up with a really great grant proposal that's fundable. Um, mm-hmm. And then you also end up with an understanding among all the actors who have to execute on the program and document it. Everybody understands who's doing what and why. I love it. So what I'm hearing is it's not just a matter of responding to questions, but it's actually project management as well and laying the, the framework for all of your programs and activities. Absolutely. Okay, Noah, thanks so much for sharing your insights. Can you share some of your favorite tips for grant seekers? Mm. I meant to prepare a list for this. So <laughs> <laughs> my absolute favorite tip which mm-hmm. um, I I always say jokingly, but is very serious. <laughs> Don't miss a deadline. Ooh yes, yes, My, yes. <laughs> I I'm always amazed when I or you know or somebody in an organization will say, well, well, can't we get an extension or um, you know, well, it'll be ready the next day. And um, funders are really serious about their schedules because not only do they have are they running their own organizations and have their their schedules to keep? But also, as an applicant, you know, our ability to meet their requirements is really our sort of our, our introduction, right? This is how they meet us, and if the way right. they meet us is miss, missing on missing one of their major requirements, that's not the right first impression because we're asking them for right. money. Um, so the deadline yeah. is very important. Um, another a similar kind of tip is following the requirements. When when a funder you know puts on their website or in their RFP requirements about 
page numbers or word counts or fonts or margins. Um, mm-hmm. They really mean it. And it's right. really, again, it's that, it's that first impression. It's really important to follow those instructions. Mm-hmm. Um, another tip uh, that I would share that we probably won't cover anywhere else in this conversation today is really the importance of trying to build a relationship with any potential funder. And mm-hmm. you know, we have to, you know, we have to be organizational ready um, and we have to present good programs and good grant proposals, but having some initial contact with a potential funder, providing some information about who you are, um, any kind of an opportunity to open that door, open their eyes in your direction um, is okay. going to be beneficial. Okay. So those are, those are my, three, my three tips for today. <laughs> okay, and along that vein, you know, and I know you have kind of shared some of this as you've gone along, but, you know, some of the lessons learned and some of the tough ones that you will never, ever, ever forget. <laughs> Well, there's so many. (laughs) Right. There are so many. Um, My favorite story is is when I got fired by an alderman's wife, but I wasn't even working (laughs) for her. (laughs) Oh, 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 oh. we have to tell everybody, this is Chicago. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Right. But that was actually, uh, yeah, that was actually, I love that story. And I got thrown out of the neighborhood just for a few years, just for a few years. Let me back in. Um, But, you know, I mean, I think, I mean, that, that, that lesson learned has to do with, I think it has to do with uh, professional etiquette and being a consultant. I was in a situation where I wasn't really mature enough to instill the right kind of confidence in um, the role that I was being considered for. And not only mm-hmm. did I not, you know, get fired from the project, but everybody was really upset with me. So um, that's probably not quite the kind of lesson learned that you're thinking about. Um, you know, the other you one, know you know, one time. When... That, that, that really is important, Noah, you know, because so often we talk about proposal writing. And when I say we, we the professionals, we talk about it in terms of a checklist. You have to do this, you have to mm-hmm. do that. But we don't. We don't open ourselves up and be transparent about the little mm-hmm. politics and the humanity that goes on yeah. every day within this process. So I want to say thank you for that, and that that is hugely important in both yeah. the relationship well, and politics. Yeah, that's a great that's a that's a great light to put on it, and I think you know I would add. The grant writing can be very stressful for everybody involved. Uh, you know, whether mm-hmm. you're writing a huge federal grant proposal and have a lot of great people working on it, or you know, even if it's one of those sort of smaller, um, more manageable applications, it's very stressful. And and um, people within nonprofit organizations have to work on these, um, mm-hmm. but they have full time jobs already. Right, this is something that's always tacked on as extra, yeah. and it's very stressful. And the grant writer, I think, you know, whether we're working internally on staff or externally, one of the things that we can do um, to really help everyone along and produce the best possible grant proposals is to help address some of that stress, um, mm-hmm. to reduce some of that for everybody by. Um, informing people, asking for things well in advance when you need information or materials from staff people, helping to helping to coordinate all of the different mm-hmm. activities that are involved. Um, all of that's very very stressful, and if the grant writer is stressed too, or of course we're always stressed, revealing mm-hmm. that stress, <laughs> acting on that right. stress. Um, right. You know, it, it it can be you know it can make for a more difficult situation. Um, you know, than than it needs to be. So, yeah, I mean, I would definitely say that some of those, you know, sort of working on some um, interpersonal strategies, communication, um, Mm -hmm. project management, 
those kinds of skills can be very, very helpful in um, in producing quality grant proposals. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, I want to let folks know that uh, we're really past our 20-minute mark. I'm sorry, I was so engrossed in the conversation. <laughs> if you have to- this is good stuff, Noah, and I, and I thank you thank so much. You. Thank you. We'll have to have you back. Yeah. Um, the call-in number is 347-884-8121, and if you're in our chat room and I see my friend at Do Good or Consulting, I'm not going to mention his name, but I love him very much. If you have a question, um, by all means, feel free to chime in in the chat room. But if anyone wants to call in and ask questions, Please do, and in the meantime, I just want to, you know, get back to Noah, and and I know that everybody on this call is probably at very different uh, different levels of development. We have people who are working with institutions. We have folks who are just considering, you know, is this grant writing thing something I want to do? Then we have folks who are at all levels in between. But regardless, you know, what are some of the things that you would recommend for Grant to do at home right now to up their grant writing game? You know, because we all have room for improvement. I don't care how long we've been doing this stuff. Oh, absolutely. Um, I mean, I always look for, for feedback on my writing and my ideas. So if you have materials already written up, um, mm-hmm. I would say, you know, spend some, some time doing some additional um, reading of that and editing. Ask somebody to read your work. It doesn't have to be somebody in your profession. Um, Somebody who doesn't know what you do or doesn't know it really well can be the best possible reader. They can give Mm -hmm. you really good feedback on on what makes sense and what doesn't. Um, If you're really just getting started on looking for funding, I would say just go, just start Googling around. Um, pick mm-hmm. some keywords that relate to what you do, what you care about, and see what you find. I mean, um, we find all kinds of interesting new funders just through random searches now. Mm-hmm. Um, of course, once you find one, you have to, you know, go through sort of the, the process of, of evaluating and stewarding and uh, applying. Um, but mm-hmm. there's, you can find some great information just by just by searching around. Okay, great. And we don't have much time left, but that word stewarding, we hear that all the time. And, again, people who listen to the show, some of us don't know anything about grant writing. So when you say stewarding or talk about stewardship, what do you, what do you mean? Oh, sure. So that relates to building relationships with funding, which I mentioned, or with funders, which I mentioned earlier. Um, but it also refers to... Um, uh, sort of a, a ma- method of managing your grants once mm-hmm. you start receiving them. And it has to do with um, uh, executing your programs the way you've promised to in your grant proposal, mm-hmm. spending your grant money the way you promised mm-hmm. to in your, in your grant proposals, keeping your funder informed early and mm-hmm. often, especially If there's a potential change, um, oftentimes uh, something will go differently than planned and we might need to make some changes. Don't be scared Mm -hmm. of your funder. Tell them as soon as you know. Um, Often they'll work with you. Um, You know, they're unlikely to let you take a grant for, um, you know, a food bank and and pay for, um, you know, child care. But within a program, you're often um, you're often given some latitude if you have a conversation about it. So mm-hmm. that's stewardship. And then, of course, the final report. You know, you're when you're giving your grant award, you're going to get some instructions about when reporting is due, and you want to do a real good job with that. Oh, okay. Thank you. Um, I was about to forget our question. Um, we have a question. Yeah, we have a question from our chat room. Um, this is from my consultant friend at Duke Gooder Consulting. What are some of the top three mistakes that people tend to make? 
Well, we don't like to focus on the negative, but since you ask, <laughs> um, I mean, I, I mean, I would say that 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 we've actually kind of talked about those already. I would say that um, you know, miss, top mistakes are things like missing deadlines. Um, leaving things out of applications. You know, you'll be given a list of things to include as part of your grant proposal and not submitting everything that's requested. Um, and those, mm-hmm. both of those are really unfortunate mistakes to be make, making because they're avoidable. Um, mm-hmm. You know, with, with a lot of, uh, of care and attention to, de- to detail. Um, and, you know, the other thing that I, I see is, is the poor sh- poor stewardship. Um, Again, you know, we're pressed for resources and oftentimes we don't have a lot of extra, um, extra time to make sure that we're, you know, that we're reporting back to our funder um, as often as we should be or as accurately as we should be. And Mm -hmm. that's just really important. Um, You know, if we want to get another grant, right. And a lot of funders will give you a couple of years if you, if you do a good job. Right, right. Okay, so we've come to the end of our show, and I'd like to thank Nora Tumina Jenkins for being my guest today. Nora, would you care to share any parting thoughts? And you've already given us tons and tons of information. And if you don't do anything but tell us how we can reach you, that would be awesome. But parting thoughts and, most importantly, contact information. Sure. Um, You know, I would just say if you're just – if you're getting started – um, don't worry about it. Just dive in. Mm-hmm. I think a lot of people are intimidated thinking that grant writing is um, is highly technical or highly professional. And um, and it is, but it isn't. I mean, it's really, mm-hmm. if, you, if you follow the instructions and you can write a clear case for support, you're really in a great place to start. So I would encourage people to go ahead and, and dive in. Um, if you want to reach me, the best way to do that is through email, and that's Noah, N-O-A-H, at Temener, T-E-M-A-N-E-R, dot net. Awesome. So I want to thank everybody for listening to Nonprofit U Blog Radio Show Talk Show today. The episode will be available for download within about an hour. Be sure to tune in next week for a very lively discussion on environmental sustainability and environmental justice. Our guest will be Naomi Davis. She's the founder of Black Sing Green. Until then, I look forward to talking to you. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you. And no, Thank you. Thanks. Okay, bye-bye. This is Dick Leiningkugel, and for 150 years, we've been brewing beer our own way. Leiningkugels is born from German tradition, but crafted with the spirit of Wisconsin. A beer with a name that remains refreshingly recognizable, even after six generations. Thanks to all our fans for 150 great years. Here's to keeping things refreshing for 150 more. Leiningkugels, welcome to the Liney side. Jacob Leiningkugel Brewing Company, Chippewa Falls, Wisconsin. Please enjoy Liney's responsibly. This is Dick Leiningkugel, and for 150 years, we've been brewing beer our own way. Leiningkugels is born from German tradition, but crafted with the spirit of Wisconsin. A beer with a name that remains refreshingly recognizable, even after six generations. Thanks to all our fans for 150 great years. Here's to keeping things refreshing for 150 more. Leiningkugels, welcome to the Liney side. Jacob Leiningkugel Brewing Company, Chippewa Falls, Wisconsin. Please enjoy Liney's responsibly. Wow, nice haul. Told ya. Macy's Backstage has perfect last-minute gifts. With prices so low, you never need a coupon. I scored the perfect makeup palette. Super cute. I grabbed these cool drones for the guy. Nice. Here's a handbag for Aunt Helen. Found awesome toys for the kids. Cookware for the budding chef. Oh, and look what I got for Uncle Hank. A puppy chew toy? No, no, that's for Rex. They even have gifts for pets. Well, you know Uncle Hank. He'd love anything <laughs> we gave him. Macy's Backstage. Savings for everyday life. Details at Macy'sBackstage.com. 
Get to Old Navy two days only, today and tomorrow. Wrap up Old Navy's PJ pants for adults for just five bucks. That's right, five bucks. Don't sleep on it. It ends tomorrow at Old Navy and OldNavy.com. Valid 1215 to 1216, select styles only.